Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Another year and another chance for us to wonder what the heck went wrong with the Calgary Flames. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Uh, Matt, not the position I expected we would have been in when the season started. No, uh, this it's one of those years where if it could go wrong, pretty much it did for the Calgary Flames. And they find themselves two points out of the final playoff spot ahead of the Florida Panthers. I would say three points because they, they couldn't have made it on the tie. Yeah. Although they were ahead of the Florida Panthers, who did make it in the East. So there's that little sh- shred of dignity. <laughs> there you go. Well, let's, uh, I guess, recap quickly the last two games. I don't think we need to go as in-depth with these as we usually do, because everyone knows what happened already. But the Calgary Flames uh, played their 81st game in Calgary against the Predators. This is an important one. And it was tied 2-2 going into a shootout. Matt, did Daryl Sutter cost the Flames a season by shooting Richie as his thir- as a shooter? His hunch wasn't a bad idea because he had beaten Soros before. So I can kind of understand the logic of it. But yeah, that was one of the most baffling decisions. You know, you shot Huberdeau, he got a goal. You shot Kadri, it was a save. You shot Richie next. Like, Toffoli should go there or, or Majapane or, or Backlund yeah. or Anderson or yeah like if you're eight or nine guys in throwing Richie in sure but yeah that was a bit of a weird decision but ultimately it really wouldn't have mattered even if the Flames had won that game they would have finished with 94 points one back of the Winnipeg Jets so like ultimately like it would have put a little bit more pressure on Winnipeg had they won that game because then, like, the Jets would have had to win one of the two games uh, in order to make the playoffs, but they would have beat the Wild anyway. So, it yes, but no. Like, realistically, the, the game that killed us was the Chicago game last week. I think that that decision is going to be one that the Sea of Reds is going to be talking about and scratching our heads over for a long time. Yeah. It, it's... It, it certainly is a decision, <laughs> you know, like it, it, the only person like, I think that would have been more baffling was if they put Chris Tanev in the <laughs> shootout just because like that's completely not his game. But I don't know. I'd say because even defen- even Lucic would have made more sense in my yeah, mind. I would say Lewis would be baffling stone. Well, stone, you could just get him to pull out the old Brian Rolston you know, skate in and then just rip a slap shot. Right <laughs> or just rip it right from center. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Flames lost that one and with kind of an odd choice from Daryl. And that brought them to game 82 where they were officially out of the playoff race. Uh, so the Flames decided, you know what, let's uh, let's see what some of our young players look like. And in this game, we saw Dustin Wolf make his NHL debut playing uh, 59-54 for the Calgary Flames. And we also saw Matt Coronado get in the lineup. The Calgary Flames win 3-1 to one against San Jose Sharks, getting Wolf his first NHL win. And surprisingly enough, not only the first multi-point game, but the first hat trick for Nikita Zadorov. If you would have said to me, an unexpected flame is going to get a hat trick, I would not have gone with Zadorov. Again, the only ones that would have been more baffling were guys like Tanev and Lewis and... <laughs> Yeah, the only it, guy it was he, good to see Big Z get it. You know, like he's had, he frankly was probably the most improved flame this year, and he had a real dynamite season from the back end. And get, capping that off with a hat trick in game eighty two, uh, you know, all the props to him. Like he had an awesome season, and I'm hoping, like in his uh, comments, he said after on garbage bag day that he'd like to stay here for the rest of his career. And frankly, if he keeps playing like that, there's no reason why the Flames shouldn't keep him for as long as they possibly can. For sure, yeah. He said he told uh, he told the media that he would like to spend the rest of his career in Calgary, and and that's always nice to hear, especially when you've got you know players that are maybe a little disenchanted by the way the season ended, and we'll talk about some of those guys a little bit later. Um, but it's always nice to hear a guy saying, "Yeah, I'd like to to finish my career here." Yeah. Oh, yeah, and, like, especially, like, you know, with all the controversy with their whole personality grading on certain people, you know, it also helps to have people that, 
thrive under that kind of a coach and you know finding ways to be successful under that kind of guy because it doesn't look imminently like Daryl's going to be replaced and if that's the case um, the Flames are definitely in a position where they will need guys that are more than happy playing in that so sort of situation. What We saw an interesting third line here. The third line in this game, or I guess we could call it the third line in this game, was Kadri on a line with Peltier and Coronado. What do you think of that line? I like Matthew Coronado. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing him next year in the NHL. I honestly, if he plays like that, he's going to make the team out of training camp. Like he, he was dynamite. He was. And, you know, we need to temper some expectations there. We've seen guys come in and look good in their first game to burn their contract year and then never get back to that point. And with the game not having a lot on the line, I could see where maybe he you know, didn't have as much pressure, but I agree with you. He was probably one of the best, if not the best flame on the ice that wasn't Dustin Wolf. And I think that's a heck of a showing to show what he could do. Yeah. And I'm sure that Pelte has been bugging him, telling him like all the things that, you know, cause of his lessons learned, uh, conditioning wise and what to expect next year that I'm sure that he's going to be chatting at Coronado to, you know, like train extra hard <laughs> if you want to actually stay, in the NHL next year. Well, and Matt Coronado is now living with Dubé, and they've been uh, talking a lot, the two of them as well. So I think Dubé is a great guy to learn that from because Dubé is another guy who, again, maybe wasn't, you know, maybe wasn't just destined for the NHL right away and had to fight his way in. So I think, you know, if you're going to learn that from a guy, Dylan Dubé is a great guy to, to be talking to there. Oh, I agree. And it, it's... A good situation for those young guys. And um, Coronado, if he wants it, the job's there for him. And, you know, he's going to be getting an earful on all the things that he'll need to do. And it will be difficult for him going from an NCAA schedule to an NHL schedule. Uh, so, like, even if, like, he does stick in the NHL, uh, don't be surprised if he struggles halfway through the season as he gets fatigued. But... Yeah, you know, uh, and it might be one of those where he only plays part of the year up here. But uh, either way, you know, it, it'll be good for him to, you know, push forward and try to make this team next year. With that, the Calgary Flames have now completed their 82 games. They end the season 38 wins, 27 losses, and 17 overtime losses for a total of 93 points. Winnipeg holds down the last wild card spot with 95 points. The Flames really need three points because they can't beat Winnipeg on tiebreakers to get in. Yeah, and realistically, the 7-17 seven and 17 that they went in overtime... You know, if you even shave three, you know, losses over and make them 10 and 14, like that's still a bad overtime record, but that makes the Flames a playoff team. Or, you know, a couple of the last minute uh, games or, you know, losing every game to Chicago or, you well, know. And I think even on top of that, the Flames played an NHL high 48 one goal games. Like with the firepower they have in their lineup, they needed to play a lot less of those and secure that win a lot earlier. Mm -hmm. And as we saw, I mean, what was it up until the second last week of the season, the flames did not come back when they were down in the third. Like, yeah, there's so many, this season feels yeah. like a death by a thousand cuts. Yeah. It was literally one of those where if it could go wrong, it did. And that's part of the reason why it, like, it's hard to look at this team and say like, Oh, go and rebuild and blow it up because like all of the underlying metrics say like this team like the fundamentals of the team are good and like if they even had adequate goaltending or you know Huberdo not having an NHL record drop in his uh point totals or if Kadri played well or if Majapani and Lindholm didn't fall off on the goal totals or this or this or this or this or this or this, or this. <laughs> you know like if any of those things don't happen the Flames make the playoffs but it literally took all of those things to happen for the flames to miss and odds are that that is not going to happen again next year so it's like how do you adjust things to improve the team while you know and change maybe the culture a bit while maintaining the good aspects of the team 
Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Let's do an autopsy on this team. And we're not going to look too far ahead to next year. We'll do that as we approach July 1st. Um, but let's let's break down what we just saw. So, Matt, you started to talk there about my first question. Should the Flames go into a rebuild after, I think everyone would say, a disappointing end of the season? Um, I would say no, just because of, well, two factors. One, you don't really have any expiring contracts of note other than Milan Lucic, which basically his contract goes to Jonathan Huberdeau. Yeah. Um, and you're not really having a ton of cap room or you know like there's you would not, have to start selling yeah and like there are too many pieces to sell like frankly it to go into a rebuild like you look at a team like chicago who was kind of a borderline ish playoff ish team but not quite like it took them selling off kane and you know like going through like the whole list of guys over a couple of years and like making like six or seven big trades to like completely tear down and like the flames would need to do that much just to get to as bad as chicago was before they blew up and then would have to like blow up again the rest to tear down like it, it, there are just too many pieces and parts to this team that are good and viable to throw it all out I agree. I mean, you know, and again, we as Flames fans look at this as, you know, maybe a, ver a disappointment, but we're only three points away from a playoff spot. Like, this is a team that, by all accounts, should have been a contender. And I don't think you can say, well, we had a one disappointing season after a very significant change in the summer. Let's just blow it up. Now, if they were in the same spot next year with a very similar core... I think, you know, you have an argument there, but I think you've got to look at this as a blip on the radar, make some changes, as you said earlier, but I think you have to move forward with this core as though you're going to be a contender next year. Well, you look at Vegas, right? And, like, we basically mirrored Vegas, it seems, over the last number of years. And Vegas last year missed the playoffs by a couple of points. And... You know, they were kind of in that same, you know, questioning everybody mode that the Flames are currently. And they pretty much just stuck to their guns. They added a couple of minor parts. But, you know, they basically rolled out the same team that they finished with. And they just won the division again. And, you know, like, yeah, the, the main difference is that they transitioned away from Marc-Andre Fleury and Robin Leonard to Logan Thompson which the Flames could easily do a similar thing with incorporating Wolf more. But it, it's one of those things that, you know, when, when you have, like, all the if and maybes go one way <laughs> this year, which this way for us this year was, like, everything went wrong, you know, it, it's going to regress to the mean. And, you know, like... It, there are sometimes the season like what the Bruins are having where everything's gone right for them. Like they're not as good as their record. It, you know, and it's finding that middle point of like, okay, this is actually roughly what this team is. And it's pretty much like in that same grouping as LA Edmonton and Vegas. It's just, okay, well, what do you do to accentuate those things and improve upon? So that way, the team is given as good of a shot in a, on a blank page next year to, you know, hit the reset button and get going for game one. Yeah, and, you know, I think if you look back since Vegas joined the league, the only two teams that have been number one in the West is either Calgary or Vegas, and they've rotated on in and out. So. Good news there. Next year, Calgary will probably be number one in the Pacific Division because it's their turn. Yeah. But yeah, I think, you know, Vegas is a good analogy there that, you know, they've had up years and down years. And I would even look at, you know, Seattle, who has not as good a roster as Calgary and made it in. Like, I think it shows that anybody can make it if they're firing on all cylinders. Yeah, because like Seattle really is not far ahead of what Vancouver is uh, in terms of talent of roster. But, you know, everybody was pulling in the same direction on uh, the Kraken and where the Canucks were uh, having issues. And, you know, it, that was pretty much the difference between the two teams. And, you know, yep. and, you know, like, are you expecting like Manjapani to get like, what was it, 18 goals next year? No, like he's 
there were so many games where he just missed or he hit the post where, you know, slightly better luck and he's a 30 goal guy again. And, you know, like you can go through the list of the guys that struggled. Like, um, Huberto finally, like towards the last like 10, 15 games of the year, looked like he was himself in Florida, which, you know, like if he were regresses to his mean of being slightly over a play, point per game like a 90 point guy well that's you know like you've all of a sudden got like double the production from that player you know and like you can go through everybody who's struggled epically like they're not going to have that kind of bad year again and like markstrom is not going to be as bad as he was this year uh, and he showed that, like, down the stretch where he was playing more like himself through the last, like, from March on. This team almost looked like a very different team after the All-Star break. Yeah, pretty much. Like, they struggled mightily in February, like, immediately after the All-Star break. But as it got towards the trade deadline, and, you know, honestly, it was, I think, the addition of Troy Stetcher uh, to the team helped to, uh, like, calm things quite a bit. And uh, you saw a lot fewer defensive miscues um, throughout the lineup, I felt, after that point. Um, and that made Markstrom's job very easy compared to, you know, like multiple breakaways and other, you know, stupidities <laughs> that plague the well, team. Well, Markstrom started to look a lot stronger then, too. Yeah, it was kind of, a, you know, both affecting each other. Kind of thing. Like, I didn't think that Markstrom looked markedly different other than, like, he wasn't facing, you know, like, there were times earlier in the season where the, he, he was facing, like, five or six dynamite chances in the first, like, ten minutes of a game. And, you know, like, he gave up two or three goals. And it's like, yeah, well, if any other goalie was facing that, you know, it would be the same thing. And yet, you know, and psychologically when it keeps happening it rolls on you and you know like he struggled mightily throughout the year and um but that he finally got through whatever the problem was and the team got better composed defensively and they started winning all the games pretty much and like their record down the stretch was actually rather impressive it's just too little too late we know that Milan Lucic is a free agent this summer and really the only free agent of note. I mean, technically not the only free agent. Nick Ritchie, also a free agent. Trevor Lewis, also a free agent. Troy Stetcher, also a free agent. Michael Stone, also a free agent. Um, but I would say the only free agent of note and with some money behind him. Do you see the Flames, and you mentioned it earlier, you know, some of those expiring contracts next year, guys like Backlund, Lindholm, Defoley, Hannafin, Tanev, Zadorov. Um, do you see the Flames going out and moving one of those this summer? I could. Uh, frankly, uh, I could see the Flames deciding to sell high on Elias Lindholm just because of the fact that um, he seems to be disgruntled a bit just based off of interviews. and His exit interview, he didn't really give a committal answer if he wanted to be back or not. Yeah, and... Frankly, like after the whole Kachuk Gaudreau thing, um, it's better to move the asset now while you you know you're in the driver's seat and have a full year on a guy who's only going to make four million dollars and change, which is a huge deal for you know any team. You know, like you could say target the Detroit Red Wings, say who have the ninth overall draft selection and are looking to rise into the playoffs you know like that would be a good synergy there uh if the flames were to ask for that for lindholm and you know like that would help the flames significantly getting two good young guys in the top 15 and you know kind of rebuilding without rebuilding and then you know because if you look at the roster composition cadre is a first line center and Lindholm is also a first line center. And if you're giving Kadri more responsibility, I think he would play better than he did down the stretch. And it's one of those things that, you know, you've got, uh, even though you're not as fussed on the player, uh, Dylan Dubé could become a good second line center. 
Um, or you could find that kind of a guy in free agency or through another trade, and you don't necessarily need to get that first line caliber guy back. But you know, it, it's one of those where you could even have Michael Backlund become your second line center for next year. Du Dubé as your third line center, and you know, like there are ways of going about it where you could lose Lindholm without like destroying your team and then you know recoup a whole bunch of things for asset wise through draft picks etc you know and make yeah, it work and, still and if you're looking to bring in a sort of a veteran third line second line center I could even see the flames targeting Taves or Stahl or one of these older guys even a Lars Ehler who could you know veteran guy you know what you're getting out of them exactly and you know, like even if you ran, say, Kadri, Backlund, and you know, Ehlers or Stahl or whatever, like that's still a respectable trio of centers. And you know, you could just, you know, perhaps with the ninth overall pick or the fifteenth overall pick, draft centers, and you know, hope that you know, and then you have Connor Zari who's on his way. So like, it it's one of those like where you could manage to you know not really negatively impact your team with while transitioning your team moving forward beyond next year there was a i guess news that came out this week i believe broken by ryan leslie at sportsnet that says in the summer michael michael backland asked the flames for a trade and then rescinded it in his exit interviews when asked if he'd come back he said we'll see what happens he said he's 34 he's looking for a cup so i mean if if Backlund wanted to trade last summer, and, and I think it says something probably about the team guy Backlund is that the Flames lost two top guys, and he also then rescinded his trade offer, or I don't know if it was before or after, but kind of saying, hey, you know, there's been enough loss here. Maybe I shouldn't get traded, but I could see that bubbling back to the surface. And I don't think you'll move more than one of those deals, but I could see if Backlund wanted to trade last summer that that could rear its head again. Yeah, and it's... One of those where, you know, there is a situation where you could move both. Um, you would just need to make sure that you're getting a guy. You need to get roster players back. Yeah, you would need, like, if you moved backland, you would need to get, like, a young center prospect who's ready to step in the NHL right away. You know, and, like, assume that Connor Zara is making the NHL. And, you know, kind of transitioning a bit and you would still need to go get out get an Ehlers or a stall or whatever yeah i would say you'd probably want to get maybe that young prospect and then maybe somebody's you know third center who you think might have the ability to play higher yeah and you know th then you could also do uh like what montreal did where you know you use uh your capital of uh in their case romanoff to get a draft pick to then go get Kirby Doc. And it's one of those where like the Flames could make the trade with say Lindholm with the idea of using draft picks to go get young second line, third line center prospect here and then flip backland as well. So that way you're kind of getting like retooling on the fly without blowing up basically it, like getting rid of disgruntled people because like frankly with daryl you know and we said this kind of when uh he got hired that his attitude was going to sort out the problems with the team uh, in terms of like the guys who couldn't cut daryl's system and personality would kind of find their way out of the organization where the, this team has kind of struggled for a extended period of time of not being able to overcome the hurdles. And, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing if certain people are disgruntled and get moved because of the fact that the ones that are here are the type of guys who can thrive under Daryl's system and, 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 you know, go from there and see and... You know, and then hope that things work out in a little bit more balanced fashion next year. Yeah, I can see one of those deals being moved, potentially. And I think even if nothing else, just to free up some money. Because the Flames, even with Lucic leaving, and we'll come back to Lucic in just a second here. But with Lucic leaving, with that money going to Huberto, that leaves you at 
positive sixty six hundred fifty thousand dollars on your cap. So, I mean, they're already right at the cap. They're going to need to figure something out. But let's talk about that. Let's talk about the UFAs here and who you'd bring back. Oh, yeah. And let's start with Milan Lucic. Uh, no. Frankly, he is as good as he's been um, for the team uh, since... You know, like he was basically the anti James Neal. Um, this deal has kind of been a financial anchor uh, for. Would you bring him back at less than a million? No, I think that even though with his leadership and all that, it, this is one of those instances where I think he would be happier, say, going and playing in Boston for the league minimum, or Vancouver, or. You know, somewhere he w- wants to play and maybe go for another cup instead of being like the 13th forward here. And frankly, like the Flames need more foot speed. And like we saw Walker Dewar basically come in as an unheralded piece and cement himself as a possible top nine forward moving forward. And, you know, like foot speed matters. And, you know, like Walker Dewar is not the most talented offensive player, but because of his foot speed, he's able to do things that a guy like Lucic simply can't. And, you know, as we're moving into kind of a rebuild on the fly kind of thing, you're going to need more guys with speed in order to, you know, retain the ability to generate offense. I agree. What... I just don't know if a team like Boston or Vancouver is going to take a, a shot on Lucic. I think, honestly, if Lucic wants to stay in Calgary, this might be a guy that you see sign a veteran deal with the Wranglers. And that could be, too. Throw the C on him down there, you know, and, and put him with the Wranglers. And I could totally see that if he wants to stay in the Alberta market. Or if the Flames do sign him... The Flames signed to a league minimum and just assigned him to the Wranglers. So he's able to be brought up if they if they need him, but he's starting the season in the AHL. Yeah, and frankly, like with Lucic and like the vibe that I get from him as a person, that I think he wants an NHL job regardless. Oh, I do too, but I just don't know if the, an NHL team wants to give him a job. No, and that's where... I think, he w- I think for any team, whether it's AHL or NHL, he's a late signing. Yeah, and honestly, I think that like he might be one of those PTO guys who then retires at the end of the training camp. Um, we'll see. Uh, yeah, know. no, I, and I could see that too. I could see him going on a PTO, not getting it, but if he still thinks he's got legs coming back here, I can see this guy being a part of the Flames organization for a long time. Yeah. Sort of like Stajan, like Conroy, like McGratton. These guys are still around in various capacities, and I could see the Flames doing him a solid there if he wants to stick around. Yep. And balls in his court entirely. Nick Ritchie making 2.5 this year. Do you bring him back? Honestly, no. Um, uh, he was okay with the Flames. Um, and he's been okay with the other teams. And, like, if the Flames needed a 13th, 12th, 13th forward with that physicality, sure. But, you know, in the same vein, you know, like, if you're looking for that, like, 12th forward guy, you know, like there are, I am in, in extremely confident that you could find basically generic 12th, 13th forward guy with more foot speed than what Richie brings. And I think if we're trying to promote young players, that's a, a position you could fill from within. Exactly. Like you, you could start Connor Zari in that spot or, you know, in Phillips. Yeah. It, you know, Peltier. I wouldn't be opposed to bringing Richie back as your 13th forward at sub million dollars. Yeah, and you could pretty much say the same with Trevor Lewis. Like if the Flames got him for like a million dollars or less and brought him as the 12th, 13th forward, sure. Well, right now Lewis is making 800,000. I think Lewis has a lot more presence in the dressing room than people give him credit for. So I could definitely see, but I think it's one or the the other of those guys. And I would rather have Lewis over Richie. Yeah, same here. Ten times out but of I, ten. But I think Lewis will be here as long as he wants to be here with Daryl Sutter as coach. Yeah, exactly. And you you, you can tell um, there are certain guys who thrive under Daryl's way of coaching, like Tyler Toffoli. Like, honestly, I'm fully expecting Toffoli to be re-signed uh, shortly after he's able to talk contract. Um, and, you know, it 
it'll be interesting to see. I would, I'm frankly, I'm already kind of penciling Lewis in the lineup for next year. Um, just because of, you know, fit and, and, and. And then on the back end, Troy Stetcher at 1.25. Oh, I, I want him back easily. Me too. Yeah. He fits like a glove. Uh, I'd go one and a half at most. And, you know. Yeah. I don't think you need, I don't think he's worth a lot more than you're paying him now, but for where he is and what he's paid, I think he's a good value. Yeah. He just seems to fit the team well and mm-hmm. um chemistry is a thing and he him and Zadorov bounce off of each other extremely well uh, i thought that um Zadorov played better with stetcher than all of the other guys that he played with all season so it's one of those where like that could be a kind of good foundational third pairing moving forward Michael Stone said uh, during his exit interviews that he's very comfortable in Calgary and he has no desire to move. I feel like if you're bringing Stetcher back and if we're getting Shillington back, I mean, that's your seven there. You don't really have room for Stone. I could see, sort of like I mentioned with Lucic, and I think it's more reasonable with Stone that the Flames sign this guy because they like this guy and they start him as your veteran guy in the American League. I agree. Especially Uh, if he just wants to play hockey in Calgary. Yeah, and... You know, if you made Stone the captain of the Wranglers, as you put it, and, you know, recall him in case of injury, you know, he'll probably pl- yeah. end up playing, you know, with Tanev being perpetually hurt, like, he'll probably end up playing 20 games anyway. Exactly, and I think that's what you pitch, Michael, on. Look, we're going to send you down there. We need you to be a veteran presence for the Wranglers. You're the first call-up. Um, you know, this is how we got to manage this if you want to stay here. Yeah. And you you can go teach Kuznetsov and Poirier how to be NHLers and Mm -hmm. whomever else we got down there and just, you know, go do your thing. Exactly. And that's really it for the NHL roster. Um, I I would, I think they will find a way to get Stone a Calgary Flames contract. Like, again, this is a guy that I think if he wants to stay here, he'll be a flame as long as he wants to be. Yeah. Whether that's. Uh, on the ice, or if he wants to be a coach for the Wranglers or the Hitmen. I mean, we see that with, you know, Stajan. He's one of these guys that they'll find a role for him in the organization. Yeah, exactly. And, like, honestly, I think that, like, 10 years from now, Sillon will still be here in some capacity. Just Almost like Conroy, right? He just He's here. He's, he's around. Yeah, and that's a good thing. Yeah, whether he's, I mean, he's not a great media guy. Couldn't see him doing media. But, yeah, I think they'll find some role for him. Mm-hmm. And with an American League team here now, I mean, maybe he's coaching an American League team, or we'll see. Yeah. Let's quickly go through some of these names on the American League side. Uh, Walker Dewar in RFA, I think you have no choice but to qualify him. Oh, and, for I sure. I mean, he'll, he'll sign. Yeah. He'll probably sign a league minimum deal just to be an NHL player next yeah, year. Yeah, he's making more than that now. He's at 827. I don't think you pay more than 875 for that guy. Yeah. Yeah, no, and he'd probably take less as a guaranteed, like, one-way deal uh, yeah. to be in the NHL. And, you know, like... I'll, and I wouldn't even be... And I would imagine that would be, you know, a two-, three-year deal as well. Even if it's just a one-year deal, um, you know, which would make sense for him. Uh, you know, like, there's a give and a take. Like, the Flames might be able to get him two years on a league minimum, but, you know, there's some give and take on that. And if the Flames could get him, like the dollar amount as low as possible on a shorter term deal. I think that makes more sense where they say, okay, go out, be awesome. And yeah. you know, when free agency and all that stuff and again, next you year, be part of this team, we need you to do us a solid. We're going to give you an NHL job. You need to give us some cap relief. Yeah. And it's not a mon- bunch of money, but it's some significant yeah. to you, but not, really in the scheme of things and go yeah. out, be awesome. And then re- we'll revisit this in a year or two when exactly. we have more flexibility with all the other guys going and getting yeah. dealt with and then give him like a two year, three, two and a half million, three million if he deserves it kind of deal. Matthew Phillips is an interesting one. He's a UFA. He's making league minimum. I can't see the Matthew Phillips wanting to come back here as a an AHL player, and I think after the year he's had and the year that the Wranglers have had, I think there's going to be interest from other organizations. Oh, yeah. I'm sure that there are 31 teams that are interested in Matthew Phillips, Just even if it's just to see if he can turn into, like, the next, you know, insert miscellaneous guy that, you know, like Jonathan Marcia, so 
solid bottom six guy or even middle six guy. Yeah. And, you know, like Marsha still had a similar trajectory and then he got an opportunity and he's been great ever since. And do you uh, think he'll stick around with the flames? I think that it's less than a 5% chance, frankly. Um, and honestly, I don't see him being much more than what Austin Zarnick was in the NHL. Like, uh, you can tell the skills there, but uh, just impacted by his size. And it's unfortunate to say that that is a factor, but that really is a factor. And, you know, like, it, as much as like a guy like Gaudreau was successful... Gaudreau, like, if he was honestly six Goudreau's foot... Gaudreau's the exception, not the rule. Yeah, like, if Gaudreau was, like, six foot one, he's on the same level as Connor McDavid. It's just, you know, he's also very tiny. So, like, there was severe limitations on Gaudreau because of his size. And, you know, like, you basically need to be that caliber of player in order to overcome it, and I don't think Phillips quite is. In a different Calgary Flames reality, in a reality where the Flames were not expecting to make the playoffs, I could see them putting Phillips in there um, because I think he's a serviceable NHLer. But with the Calgary Flames looking for a, a playoff run, I believe, next year, I don't think that he's the guy that factors into the plan, especially if Daryl Sutter's the coach. Yeah, no, and I don't think he'd get any opportunity realistically if Daryl's still the coach, which it looks like he will be. So I, I have I, I strongly feel unless Phillips is I mean Phillips is a Calgary boy I think he probably signed one more year here than I believe he probably expected to because he wanted to play in front of Calgary fans for the Wranglers so unless that's a big draw for him he's 25 I think this is the time when you either make the NHL or become a career HLer I think sort of like Glenn Godden here who never really amounted to anything and had to go to another organization to see if it was just Calgary or if it was him. I think we're going to see Phillips uh, walk as a free agent. Yeah, and like I could see him going to a team like Anaheim or, you know, insert miscellaneous bad team here. I could see him fitting well in St. Louis. Yeah, or Chicago. Like, there, there are plenty of teams where, like, they just need bodies at the NHL level. And, like, I'm sure that he'd get a shot to see if there's anything there, there. And if he sticks, great. Uh, you know, found money for that team and, uh, you know, he'll earn a lot of money. And that would be great for him. And, you know, we, I'm sure, both wish him nothing but the best. It's just... Great guy. Yeah. Good kid. Yeah. Um, I hope he does really well in the NHL. But I just, I think with the numbers the way they are and with a guy like Coronado and Phillips, or sorry, Coronado and Peltier, and even Dewar now, I think, ahead of him on the depth chart, I don't think there's room for him. No. And frankly, like even Connor Zari is pretty much caught up to him. And, you know, like you're going to get def gift deference to guys that are physically bigger than the five foot six guy. Like, and I'm not saying he'll never be back, but I think he has to go somewhere else to figure out if he is an NHL or, and if not, and he's, and if he feels that he's going to toil away in the AHL, maybe he decides to come home and do that. But I think you have to go away to figure, to see if an organization will give you that chance, see what you've got. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, the only other name we'll talk about here that I think maybe is one that Flames fans have been excited about, 27-year-old Connor Colton Pullman, sorry. He's uh, 27, making league minimum. 27 years old is old for a guy who's really never made the NHL. If they bring him back, I don't think it would be on, an, on a Flames deal. I think that would be an AHL deal, but I think this guy's now past his uh, NHL potential age. Yeah, it's one of those where, you know, he's AHL player uh, level player not yeah i think some fans hoped that he would be an nhl player um and you know i i think that at this point at 27 he's i'm not saying he won't be back but i just don't know if the flames use one of their 50 contracts on him i agree otherwise not really anyone else of note there's i think it's you have to even if for no other reason than uh Cap wise, you have to start relying on some of those young players. And after a great season, I mean, we saw the Wranglers won the AHL. Um, they're going to get a first round buy. I think you you owe it to some of those guys to give them a shot next year. Yeah, cough, Dustin Wolf, cough. Yeah. <laughs> what which of those young players that we talked about or that we didn't do you feel will be on the Flames opening day roster? Dustin Wolf. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I also could see uh, Connor Zari make it. Um, what about Jacob Peltier? 
Pelte definitely. I honestly, so, I think that the Flames are going to have a bit of a slightly different roster feel next year, where you're starting to introduce a bunch more young guys. Like especially if you look at other teams that are successful, they have a few good young players filtered in their lineup, and you know, like on the defense, like the Flames don't have anybody that are imminently up because most of the Flames' defense are in that 24 to 28 years old range anyway. So they're they're kind of already set for like the young infusion into the team. It's um you know injecting some of that youth on, amongst the forwards and getting some of the quick guys into the lineup. I think the default for the Flames the last couple of years when they've had a roster spot was to fill with a vet, and I think that the big change is going to be fill internal where we can. Yeah, well, how do you say, before the team didn't really have young guys who are ready for the NHL job, and we even saw that at training camp this year, where, like, Peltier was expected to make the team out of camp, but disappointed. Phillips was expected to push for his spot, disappointed. And, you know, like, every young guy, just disappointed. And that should have been the warning signs right there. Yeah. But, you know, like, they've all learned from the, those things in training camp. And, like, Peltier got better through the season. And Zari got better through the season. And, 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 and. And you're starting to see, like, guys who have actually grown into NHL caliber talents, like Coronado, like Dewar, who, like, honestly, I don't think anybody expected Walker Dewar to be anything more than a cup of coffee guy who gets like three or four games like a redeem Zahorna and then goes away again. But, you know, he's emerged as a quality NHL player. And, you know, if the team can, like they now have guys that they can legitimately point to and say, okay, it's your turn to audition for this spot. We're giving you the, you know, at least a fourth line role take it and run with it. And, you know, like, it, it, it's not to say that, like, those guys will stay on the fourth line, but you look at, like, Andrew Mangiapane, his first full season, he was playing on the fourth line with Garnett Hathaway. Yeah, I think you have to kind of come to the season and slot those guys in, and it has to become their spot to lose. Yeah, and there's always guys at the end of training camp, like Brett Ritchie didn't sign until late, um, that you can go and pick up for... Yep negligible you know tobias reader when he was here yeah you can even go on like waivers at the end of training camp because there's always a huge laundry list of guys that are kind of quasi nhl players that like if say like peltier and zari and Dewar all struggle you can go pick off a couple of those guys and throw them in as a you know let's see and, you know, have a battle between the two new or new guys and everybody else to try and fill those spots from within. And, you know, let's move a little bit off the ice then and discuss uh, some of the big topics that have been talked about with the coach and the GM. So let's start with the GM. The general manager, Brad Living's contract is up at the end of this year. He has not signed a new contract. Um, he is he was apparently offered one at the same time Daryl was and didn't sign it. Do you see Brad Treliving coming back? I would be extremely disappointed if the Flames moved on from Brad Treliving. Uh, I what if the Flames don't move on from him, but he moves on from the Flames? Is same thing. Like it, it would be a blow to the team. Um, full stop. Like uh, frankly, between him and Steve Eiserman, I think those are the two best general managers in the entire sport. Uh, with Joe Sakic being right there as well. Um, yeah, he, he, Calgary has had a really good general manager. Uh, like the flames have actually been a competitive team and like finished atop the conference a couple of times under his tenure. Like that's a big deal. Like, yeah, they fell on their face both times, but in the playoffs, but that's kind of also not on him. And that's also partially why Daryl's here because you have to sort out, well, how are you screwing up this badly? <laughs> and, you know, so get experienced cup winning coach to ferret that all out. Um, it, he did not have a good off season last year, which was no fault of his own. 
because you know like literally no general managers had 200 point players both say oh adios i'm out of here and as we've learned now potentially backland as well you know and it's like uh <laughs> So the fact that, like, the Flames remained a competitive team, almost made the playoffs, and would have, if not literally everything going wrong this year, you know, like, he did a fantastic job. And, you know, like, I'm sure that there are 31 teams that would be right there to sign Brad Living. And, you know, the Flames have been blessed by having a very good general manager. And, frankly, I think, unless the Flames, you know get lucky if they have to get a new guy they're going to see a big step down in the quality of the general manager and that'll be a very big disappointment for the flames because you know they actually have a really good guy on, in job at, right at the moment. true living's been here for nine seasons now and i agree with you i'd be very disappointed if he left i've been a big supporter of tree since we got him you've heard me say this over and over on the show but i also wonder if tree would want a new challenge. And I think, you know, Pittsburgh's looking for a GM. I can see that being a challenge he would like. I have a feeling that Toronto might be looking for a new GM if they don't make it out of the first round. I can see that being a, a challenge you might like. I just wonder if, and that's why I framed it the way I did earlier. I could see the Flames not moving on from him, but him moving on from the Flames to get a different challenge. Yeah, and frankly, this is one of those instances where if uh, it comes down to money, I, I think the Flames should up their offer to whatever it takes to keep him. Um, because, frankly, uh, you know, like there, there are not too many good general managers out there. And unless, like, you know, as we mentioned before, Craig Conroy, the thought is that he might ascend to be the general manager, which he might do a perfectly great job, but it's a question mark. And... You know, I don't know. I love Connie as a guy. I love him as, you know, what he does for the organization. I think he's too nice to be a GM. Um, I could see Conroy being a hard ass if he wanted to. Um, I'm sure that he has that in him. Um, it, it's just one of those where it, it's a question mark. Like, it, it, you know, unless Conroy actually got the job and either did great or did badly, you don't really know, but like he seems to be an extremely knowledgeable person. Um, and I'd like to see Conroy work as a GM in a world, uh, world cup or Olympic something first. Uh, honestly, of all of the potentials of um, candidates that I've heard uh, bandied about, like honestly, the guy if Tree goes, the guy that I'd actually be most comfortable with is Conroy. Um, but it, it's one of those that it, it's tough just because of the fact that it's a big question mark. Can I throw another potential name out there? Sure. So let me just preface this a little bit. And we'll talk more about this point in a minute when we talk about Daryl Sutter. It was, it's being said that Daryl Sutter was not Tree's choice for coach. He was the, the owner's choice for coach. And I think we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. But in that case, if you move on from the GM, I can see them bringing in a quote unquote Sutter guy. And when I look around at guys who I think are highly touted, I think Mike Fuda, who used to be in LA, who worked with Daryl in LA. He's now a special assistant to the GM in LA. He has never been an NHL GM. He's been an AGM and a highly touted AGM. I could see that being the direction the flames go to bring in a guy who knows Sutter, who can work with Sutter and trying to sort of, I mean, when tree came here, he was an AGM too. And I think trying to recreate the same magic. And that could be very well be, um, it'll be interesting to see. And, you know, like frankly, you know, having Daryl here has basically sorted out a lot of the problems that the flames have had. Uh, in terms of like he te his system is teaching the team how to play the right way and like as much as like Jonathan Huberdeau has struggled this year offensively he came from a team in Florida where what is defense um, and he needed to learn how to properly be an effective player defensively and mm -hmm. like we saw that even with Gaudreau and Kachuk in when that half season that uh, Sutter was here um, that both those guys struggled mightily and then the next year once they figured out the defense they could add in the offense and they both had their best season of their career 
And I'm I'm sure that a guy like Huberto, uh, you know, like I'm sure that this season and like having that NHL record is going to <laughs> irritate him all summer. He also now holds the record, I believe, for largest point slide. Yeah, exactly. Two seasons. You know, and it, he's the type of guy where he's going to be pissed <laughs> that you know having his name there and is going to want to be motivated to especially with the new expectations of the 10 million dollar contract wanting to live up to that and he's a very internally motivated guy from what i've seen in florida so it's one of those things that it's frustrating because like as much as like the team was what tree built there were inherent flaws in the style that the team and like that's part of the reason why they would falter regularly. Well, and that's kind of where I'm going with this too. Like I think this season we even saw the GM and the coach, and we talked about it being on different pages. The GM was bringing up young players, Daryl obviously not wanting to play them, and I can see where if Daryl and Brad were on the same page, I could see them saying, "Yeah, let's keep him around." I can see Brad saying, "If Daryl's here, I'm not." Yeah, and I can see that too, and. It's one of those things where it's kind of frustrating because, like, while Daryl is acerbic and, you know, he does great people the wrong way, um, it's sort of like John Tortorella. Like, the guy's a jerk, but he's right. <laughs> and, yep. you know, and it, it's one of those where if you're having a hard time, it's your fault, not the coach. Well, before we talk about the coach, let me just pose one other possible scenario here with the GM. Do you think there's a chance that Daryl Sutter ascends to president of hockey ops and someone like Conroy then becomes the GM? Possible, but I think that like if you're keeping like if you're keeping Daryl, you need him behind the bench. And as oh sorry no I didn't mean Daryl uh, sorry uh, do you think Brad Tree Living could become president of hockey ops and uh, and then you bring Conroy up? That's a possibility too. It, it, I just think he's too young to want to get out of the GM game. Yeah, well, like hell, Tree's not even that old, so like he, Tree's fifty three. Yeah, like he's young even for he still is. for GM, even though he has like ten years with us. Um, it's one of those things where the team just kind of needs to. Like, there's no real easy or right or wrong answer, you know, like, because most of the parts are there and they are working properly. It's just getting the mix right. And, you know, whether it's Trey doing it or, you know, Conroy or somebody else like Fuda or you fire Daryl and you bring somebody else in, like there is a mix there that's not quite working. And it'll be interesting to see exactly how things evolve from this point. Um, but I do tend to trust Daryl, you know, and like even um, with his handling of the prospects, like we saw that Peltier, he had a really good like first 15 games. And then he struggled and then got pulled from the lineup for a while. And even he said that, like, he he was just tired because, you know, Calgary being the elevation it is, like, and you're not trained for that. So, you know, it does eat your <laughs> stamina a bit unless you're specifically training for that. I and mean, you and I both said before Christmas that we thought Daryl should be fired. So there's definitely some some challenges there with him. Oh, for sure. It, and I think part and, and of that, I, I think Matt, one of the two has to go. I don't know that the GM and the coach are going to work together the way they need to. So I think it's one or the other. Yeah. And it's one of those things where it's hard because like, you know, like when we were mentioning of, Oh, well we should fire Daryl. It was, well, things are clearly not going right yeah. at this point. And like, that's the quick and easy fix to do that on the fly that's while right. you're, uh, you know, you trying to salvage the season, but you know, um, like for the longer term, like frankly, with the manner in which Daryl employs his systems and that, that is actually like a proven cup winning formula. So it, it's more like if certain personnel are not fitting that mold, then you need to try different personnel rather than. And that's where, like, the thought of moving a guy like Lindholm 
you know, doesn't all of a sudden become uh, like, oh, that's horrible. I think you could also argue, and we won't have this discussion right now because we have a lot of other things to get through. We can talk about it, you know, before the draft. But yes, Daryl won a cup with that. But is that still a formula in the current NHL? And I would have to say yes. And we don't know, right? Yeah. So um, I, I think one of the two is going to go. And I think if the GM, if, if the Flames don't have Trey Living here, what I hope they do is they lock up Conroy and Maloney for the long term. And it's been rumored that that's already happened, but I think you need some consistency of a new guy, Mike food or somebody else comes in. You need some guys who can say, this is why these decisions were made. Here's where we're at and not uh, almost start all over again. Yeah. And you, the, like the last thing you want is like guy, a new guy coming in and like, Oh, well, I'm just going to mess the whole formula yeah. that you're building toward because this team isn't, screwed up like it, it, it and and that might be more of a even a reason to either make maloney or conroy gm yeah which uh, that's why like uh, my first preference like if tree isn't here it would be conroy just because uh, yeah, like, i'd even be okay with don maloney if you want to go internal true it's just one of those where this team is not bad enough or messed up enough where you need to like rebuild because then you'd hire a specific guy for that yeah, but here's a here's a wacky idea. I don't want Hextall here. I don't. Oh want God, Burke no! Here. God, no! Um, if Toronto is out in the first round, which I think they may be, I think that there's going to be some heads rolling there. If Dubas is out of a job, would you look at Kyle Dubas? Uh, absolutely not. I think he's the worst general manager in the league. <laughs> I I really do. I hate Kyle Dubas as a general manager. I think he is absolutely terrible and got there just. He's he's do the team is doing well because of the players being awesome. He Not came the, in at that time. What was that guy's name in in uh, Arizona? J John something. Yeah, um, I know that weird guy that got. He fired. was like twenty two, and then there was this sort of these teams got this fascination with hiring young money ball like guys. There's all these you know analytics guys, yeah. and that's really how Dubas got the job. Yeah, and he. Like, honestly, he just happened to luck into a team that had Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner and, uh, you know, and Nylander and Tavares. And, you know, it, it's, yeah, he is just, like, honestly. John like, Chakio was his name. Yeah. Like, if he was, uh like, say, like, uh, the GM of, you know, say, Florida or something like that, he would have been fired, like, two or three years ago. Like You know what John Chakio does now? Oh, yeah. He and his wife run 12 Wendy's franchises. <laughs> <laughs> I'll trade you $5 for a, you know, whatever. A Frosty. <laughs> At least that's what it says in Wikipedia. And we all know if it says so on the internet, it must be true. Uh, um, let's talk a little <laughs> bit more about the coach quickly here before we get into our season predictions. Yeah. Do you think that we go into opening day without Daryl Sutter behind the bench? No. I think the fl if he was on his last year of his deal, I could see it potentially. With the fact that they've re-signed him, I think they've got too much money invested in Daryl right now to walk away. Well, it, honestly, if they were going to fire him, I think that by the time we're recording this now on the 16th, he would have already been fired. You know, like that would have been season's over, next day. He'd be your gone. scapegoat, yeah. yeah. Sort of like we saw in, in Philadelphia – or Pittsburgh, Washington already. Yeah, or Pittsburgh firing off their entire management yeah. staff. Sorry, but, that's what I meant. Not Philadelphia. I keep thinking Hextall still with Philly. But yeah. yeah, Pittsburgh or, yeah, Washington's already fired their coach. I think you're probably right. And and if, let's just say, if the Flames move on from this GM, I hope he does it sooner rather than later. And I think he would because he seems like a professional guy. So they can get the next guy in. Yeah, and that's where I could see a guy like Conroy just stepping in it or Maloney and taking the job because of the fact that like, they've already got all the info and you know, yeah. Ready to go. I, I just hope that if it happens, it happens in the month of May at the latest. Not, yeah. Yeah. At the latest before the and draft. I have to, and I have to imagine it would. Yeah. And even if, you know, even if he leaves and Conroy's the interim GM to get us through the draft, cause he knows what the plan was, I'd be okay with that as well. Yeah. And frankly, you know, like it, say you did hypothetically hire uh, Conroy for, for the next GM, like you honestly wouldn't necessarily need to have that person as the general manager for an extended period of time, like a 10 year spot like Tree did. 
you know, like if this team falters again next year and like starts going into a rebuild, that's where I think you fired the entire management staff, the coaches, and you know, like you just mm-hmm. wholesale we're rebuilding and you know everything's for sale. Come back next year. And- what I do think the Flames need in that respect is I think both for the coach and the GM they need a succession plan, and I wouldn't be surprised if. If they don't think Kirk Muller is the next guy, I wouldn't be surprised if, say, Mitch Love were to take that job as the associate coach and say, you know, learn from Daryl, you're up next. And I think if if um, Conroy becomes the GM, I think then you need to find that succession piece within the front office. I, I don't think that's Chris Snow just because of his health, unfortunately, but I think you would then need to go out and find that new guy. Yeah, I agree. You know, they've also got... Um, um, Cassie Campbell, Brad Pascal, Cassie's husband. I don't think he's NHL GM on the radar for anyone. I think he's good as the HL GM and the assistant GM. But I think, yeah, the question is, who do you bring in then to be that, you know, next heir apparent? Maybe, maybe that's Michael Stone. You never know. Uh, Jerome McGinley. No, <laughs> I think Iggy's busy with what he's doing over in Kelowna. I know. I, um, I but, just you know, had could, to throw that out there. It could be staging. There. It could be stone. It could be a lot of these guys that, again, are kicking around the organization. Yeah. Doesn't hurt. Well, Matt, at the beginning of the season, you and I made uh, some predictions. We made probably not great predictions. You ready to look back at them? Oh, yeah, this is going to be, you know, like this is our, you know, if things went normally, this is what our predictions were. We didn't anticipate literally everything going off the rails this year. <laughs> And Matt, for the first time, um, before we get there, we have tied in our predict. No, you, yeah, we've tied in our prediction game four four this year. Yay! So I didn't get. Let's skunked. take. <laughs> let's take a look at our at our predictions. Will the Flames name a captain this year? And if so, who? I said not at the start of the year, but I thought Lucic would be the captain by the end. You said no leadership by committee, and Kadri would be the captain by the end. Yeah. I think in a normal season, either of those guys could. I mean, both guys really dropped off. And I think if he's here next year, I think the Flames need a captain next year. And I think yeah. it'll be Backlund if he's here. Yeah. Will Kadri, Huberto, and Uyghur be good enough for the fans to forget about losing Kachuk and Goudreau? We both said yes. And yeah, honestly... I think we have to not give ourselves a point for that one. Yeah, I, I think that Mackenzie Weger was good enough to... But I think we're he, kind of looking at what... He was good enough to fill his part, but at yeah. the same time, if those guys as a whole did their job, we'd be in the playoffs. Oh, for sure. You know, like if Huberdeau was even an 80-point player, the Flames make the playoffs, so... So I think we have to say, yeah, one of them was good, but as a group, they did not replace what we lost. No, and that's why I had to give props to Uyghur, because he did actually come in as advertised and had a pretty damn good year. So, you know, I'm glad that he's extended for seven years, and hopefully, you know, the other two catch up. The next thing that we looked at, uh, who will have a breakout season? I said Andrew Manjapani. You said Dylan Dubé. I'll give you Dylan Dubé. Yeah. Um, eat bread. I wouldn't say it was a breakout, but it was better than I, th- than I think we all expected. I mean, yeah. he was playing on the first line for part of the season. Yeah. A good majority of the year. So, yeah. Um, uh, and I guess it is breakout. He got 45 points this year. His career high last year was 32. So, he, I'd say more than 10 points over his career high. Yeah, sure. We'll call that a breakout season. Yeah. Would I expect him to be a top six forward next year? Not necessarily. No, but you know he could. He, he he's kind of one of those. He's adequate. <laughs> you know, you could plug him yeah. in the top six, and he'll do I, a, I think, a good job. I think you've maybe overvalued Dubé. I think I've always said he was probably a middle six guy, and I think that's still where I stand with him. Yeah, I think that we're both kind of right in the bottom end of our and the top end of ours. Like you know. Thinking like he's, I don't see him as high up as you have. Though. Yeah, I think that he's pretty much a second liner, frankly, and I think that you could even agree with that. That you know, quasi, if you need him to be. Yeah, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't go into the year building him into my second line. Yeah, he just does the job uh, well. Yeah. Who needs to have a breakout season? We both said Dubé. Yeah. So I think I'll give us both a point for that one. Yeah, because he actually did fill his end of the bargain. So. 
Who will struggle this season? I said Mikel Backlund, and I'd say he was one of the few guys who didn't struggle. He had probably the best year of his career. <laughs> yeah, and you said Noah Hannafin, and I would say that I wouldn't say that Hannafin struggled. I no, don't think he, he was, took a step forward, but I think Hannafin did what we need Hannafin to do. Yeah, he was fine. Uh, and actually, to be perfectly honest, I think that the best players on this team were the six defensemen that played regularly uh, all year. And you know, and then later on Stetcher. So, um, yeah, it, it, there is literally no problem with the flames blue line. It's everything else. <laughs> frankly. All right, here's one. I'm here's one. I'm really, uh, embarrassed about now who will pleasantly surprise us. I said, Kevin Rooney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He pleasantly surprised us. By- Kevin Rooney played 17 <laughs> games. The flames had one assist for one total point. <laughs> Um, he's played 51 games of the Wranglers. He has 17 points there. I think this guy's. <laughs> you said Jonathan Hoover, though. So, I mean, yours is better, but still not right. Well, I think that uh, pleasantly surprised is like how epically they can fail. Because <laughs> the one guy yeeted himself off of the team as soon as possible, and the other broke the record for worse season. <laughs> decline ever so. so maybe the question should have been who will disappoint us this year yeah then we would add that the point we were as wrong as we possibly could be with those answers when i looked at this this morning i thought really i thought rooney oh, we're paying him a million bucks to play in the ahl that's bad i mean he's he's obviously a good you know, depth piece down there. He's got 17 points. I'm not saying he's a bad player, no. but I think maybe he's an AHL upside type of guy. Yeah. That, and the fact that he never got called up again and guys like Walker Dewar jumped over him, I think says a lot too. Yeah. Um, so neither of us are getting a point there. No, I think we should get points taken away from that answer on both of our answers there. In that case, I should probably lose a couple points. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, but, you know, I think we both expected more from him. We expected yeah. him to be a good, you know, fourth line guy. Well, I think we both pretty much expected him to be more or less like what Walker Dewar was on this team. Yeah, or even a guy like Derek Ryan. Yeah. Uh, and he just, yeah, none of that. <laughs> Who will be the top point getter for the Flames? The top point getter this year was uh, Tyler Toffoli with 73 points, 34 goals, 39 assists. Lindholm right after him. We both thought it would be Jonathan Huberto with good reason. Yeah, which nobody expected him to have that bad of, <laughs> you know, like, let's break an NHL record. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Like, yeah. And um, who will be the first call up? So I, we did forward and defense. I said Clark Bishop for the forward and Mackie or Pullman for defense. You said Zahorna and Gilbert. The actual answer was Zahorna and D. Simone. So we'll give you a half point there. Yay. And I technically, if you look at it, D. Simone and and uh, Gilbert were called up, I believe, 36 hours apart. So you, you, remember you we lost, lost two, by that much. <laughs> you you did, because yeah. Gilbert, you picked Gilbert. Um, I picked Mackie and Pullman. Oh, yeah. Mackie, was, Mackie was on the opening day roster. Oh, yeah. Which I didn't yes. expect, right? And I don't think he would have been if, if uh, Shillington was there. Yeah. But yeah, so you didn't get a full point by just a couple hours. Yep. Will any uh, call up be able to take a full time roster spot? And we said a full time roster spot was either twenty five to thirty games played or trade deadline onwards. Walker Doer played twenty seven games this year, so I'd say he yeah. did. And we both said no. This is going really good. <laughs> Who will be the first wa- flame traded? I said Shillington only because I thought that if he didn't come back, they might want to move his cap room. You said no roster player would be traded. We probably should have both picked Rooney. Um, <laughs> we, the the first, I don't even know which trade came first, but the only guys that we really traded were Mackie and Richie. Um, and I guess that was the same trade. So yeah, we were both wrong there. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, no, uh, didn't we trade Zahorna? Oh, that's right. Yeah, just a few days or same time. Yeah, just a few hours before that. I don't know what came in where during yeah, the trade. Yeah, Zahorna was first and then the other one. So. Or at least announced first. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. But yeah, um, all of those people yeah. left. So, so either way, we're wrong. Yeah. Did Do the Flames win the Battle of Alberta? We both said yes. Actual answer, no. Uh, uh, what? We were wrong on this? We couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't even beat Chicago. How are we going to win the Battle of Alberta? 
we were wrong. <laughs> like, <laughs> here's another one we're wrong on. Where will the Flames finish regular season in the Pacific Division? We both said first. Well, yeah. <laughs> Um, how many points will the Flames get in the regular season? I said 120. You said 124. I think we ended up with 93 total, so we were way off. No, uh, just a little outside. <laughs> how far will the Flames go in the playoffs? Maybe the question should have been uh, how early will they be golfing? I thought we'd get made to the Western Conference Finals. You thought Stanley Cup Finals. Yeah, that, that's a swing and a miss. <laughs> Uh, unexpected playoff hero. I said to Foley, you said Uyghur. I think if they were in the playoffs, both of those would be viable. Yeah. Will Daryl Sutter win the Jack Adams again? We both said yes. Answer is no. Yeah. <laughs> Will Brad Treliving win GM of the year? Well, I still think they probably should for what he did in the off season. I don't think it's going to happen. No. Like the fact that the flames didn't like implode on themselves, I think is a testament to his good. I can't GMing, see them but... giving GM of the year to a team that missed the playoffs. Yeah. Though. So we both said, yes, the answer is probably going to be no. I know. And we... Boston's GM, frankly, should win that. Probably. All right. Here's a question. We did get right. Both of us. Will Markstrom win the Vesna? <laughs> yeah. We both said, no, Markstrom was far from Vesna caliber this year. <laughs> Yeah, if we're talking golf scores where low as possible, then yes, we, we were right on the mark. <laughs> but yeah, no. Uh, uh. And then the last question, what do the Flames need to do to be successful for this season? Answer, everything but what they did. Yeah. <laughs> um, our answers were they need to get to the conference finals and not be blown out was what I said. You said they needed to make the conference finals. So I think that's still what they need to do to be successful this year. They just... They weren't successful. That's yeah. why we're having the discussion we are today. Yeah, so that went really, really well. <laughs> oh, man. That, Matt, how, why did I think Kevin Rooney was going <laughs> to save us a season? Our hero. <laughs> that's the reason why we missed. We, we sent him away too soon. <laughs> art hero. Our hero. Who art in the Wranglers. <laughs> Rooney, be thy name. Well, you see, the the Wranglers are first. You know, it, you know what's going to happen now? Rooney's going to go out and be their playoff hero, and I'm going to at least get some <laughs> redemption. Well, you see, the Wranglers were first. That was the reason the flame season went to crap. You know, they got rid of him too fast. <laughs> there you go. Hey, there's that Peltier kid. Or there's Rooney. No, that Peltier kid. Like, I don't know. It's... Uh, <laughs> But again, I think next year, instead of hiring the Kevin Rooney, and we all question that as a July 1 signing, but that's where I, going back to the point I made earlier, I think the Flames defaulted to veteran guys last year. I think this year, instead of the Kevin Rooney, you'd be looking at the AHL guy to fill that role. Yeah. And I could, um, I could see them sign like an AHL veteran type forward where like if things screw up, then you could put that guy realistically. Well, sort of like we talked the, about like, with Stone. Or right? even like uh, the forward equivalent of Dennis Gilbert, who's not really. Kevin Rooney. Yeah. Hey. Uh, you know, but see, we but already Rooney have look him. at him as a call up. Yeah. <laughs> hey. No, I think like Michael Stone, right? Yeah. We talked about that earlier. I think the Flames use a contract on Michael Stone saying you're starting the year in the A. I could definitely see them do that. And I think there were guys they anticipated doing that with. I still think Clark Bishop they anticipated doing that with. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, like, um, this was just a weird season all the way around and, mm -hmm. you know, it, things like that do happen. Like I remember there was one year, um, like 15 years ago where the Philadelphia Flyers were like awesome, awesome, awesome. And then randomly finished as like the second worst team in the NHL. And then we're awesome the next year. And like, that's how they got James Van Reems like, uh, back in the day. And, you know, like this seems to just be one of those where everything went wrong. Okay, that happened. And you just kind of hit the reset button. And, yep. you know, kind of, you know, it's sort of like when you have like one of those like 9-1 games where you didn't really necessarily do anything wrong. It's just every single shot went in the net. And you just kind of like, well, that game tape happened. You throw it <laughs> against the wall and sure, cool. And that happened carry on <laughs> nothing to see here and you know i think that's pretty much like what i think everybody in the organization is going to look at at from this season is just 
you know, like, because, like, Markstrom is not that bad of a goalie. Huberdo is not that bad of a player. Like, none of the, the players you know, that struggled are that bad. It, and the blessing in disguise here, potentially, Matt, I mean, in the exit interviews, Rasmus Anderson says he's still dealing with the effects of that car accident they had earlier in the year. Uh, Kadri played late last year. Um, you know, this is the earliest that uh, Coleman remembers being out. Like, I think that, you know, getting these guys a good summer of rest might be a really good thing here. Oh, for sure. And, you know, as weird as it sounds, missing the playoffs isn't the worst thing that could have happened. Um, getting a better, slightly better draft pick and a good draft year um, because of things screwing up you know, you're not as tied to players that you normally would be. So like if an uh, opportunity for trades pops up, like uh, what I mentioned earlier with the scenario with Lindholm to Detroit, like if something along that, you know, you might actually go ahead and do it instead of, Oh, well we couldn't possibly, um, you know, it, yep. and it like it op it gives you opportunities to sculpt the team in a different way. And like, the fundamentals of the organization are strong. Like, we have an absolutely good goalie in Dustin Wolf. Our defense core was the strength of this team all season. Um, and between those two things, for group be damned, like, this team is a playoff team most years if Wolf and the defense core are there. Um, so it gives the Flames an opportunity to kind of rebuild the forward group on the fly. Uh, and, you know, having guys like Huberdo and Kadri there alongside Majapani, Coleman, et cetera, et cetera, it gives you enough pieces there that you can kind of retool on the fly. So you've sort of answered my question I was going to close with today. If we were to ice the same core next year, do you think the Flames have a different result? Yes. Honestly, I if agree. you had everybody return the exact same spots, uh, this team makes the playoffs next year. I agree. You, and I think not just makes the playoffs, I think can do some damage in the playoffs. Yeah. Like, I think that's why a lot of teams were kind of secretly hoping the Flames would miss the playoffs because they didn't want, you know, like I'm sure Vegas is happy to play Winnipeg. I don't think Vegas would have been happy playing us in the first round. Um, you know, because we could actually beat them <laughs> if we got in, you know, with how hot we were down in the stretch. Like, you know, it, it we're... Winnipeg, like I'm sure that series is going to probably be a five gamer, uh, for in Vegas's favor. So, you know, it's one of those things. And like honestly, next year I'm expecting Dustin Wolf to be in the NHL. I think that they're going to move uh, Vladar in the off season. Uh, just not because Vladar was bad. Uh, it's just that Wolf. You need to make some room. He, it's one of those, you have a guy that's looking like he might be like the next Hall of Fame goaltender um, in the organization. You make room for that guy. And he. there is literally zero that Wolf can learn in the AHL next year. He needs to play 30 to 40 games, which will also benefit Jacob Markstrom because Markstrom also plays better on a lighter schedule. So, you know, giving each of them equal time and let them sort it out, uh, sort of like how the goalie situation worked up north with Campbell and a well, Let's wait until late June to talk more about what we think uh, next year's roster might look like. Oh, I agree. I just wanted to throw that in because we didn't really talk about goaltending at all. And I think that's kind of the scenario that you would see. Um in the meantime, let's enjoy the Stockton Heat's run. Or, sorry, the uh, I'm still doing it a year in. Let's enjoy the Calgary Wranglers run. A um, lot of firsts this year. They're number one in the league, something I don't think a Calgary affiliate's ever done. And there will be playoff hockey in the city. It's not going to be NHL playoff hockey, but a very good level playoff hockey. So I'd encourage everybody listening to go to the Dome. And, hey, they're not going to lose in the first round because they don't even play. <laughs> And maybe Rudy will be their playoff hero. Exactly. I uh, um, just want to talk briefly about the NHL playoffs. Uh, who do you think comes out of uh, each of the matchups in the West? And what do you think the Stanley Cup final will be? I still stand by my Stanley Cup predictions for last year. I still, or from last week that you asked me about. I still think Boston probably takes the cup this year. 
Um, as far as matchups in the in the East, I'd say Boston over Florida, Tampa over Toronto, um, Carolina over the Islanders, and the Rangers Devils is the one that I don't know how to call, and I think that one could go seven games, but I'm going to go Rangers. In the West, I'm going to say Dallas over Minnesota, Avalanche over Kraken. As much as it pains me to say it, I think Edmonton over L.A., and Vegas over Winnipeg. Yeah. Um, for me, Boston, Toronto, uh, Carolina, and the Rangers. Um, Colorado, Dallas, um, Vegas, and L.A. And so we're the same, except you flipped Edmonton and L.A. And uh, Toronto. I think okay. Toronto will actually, for the first time in the salary cap era, <laughs> make it out of the first round. <laughs> Being that this is the end of the road for the Flames, uh, Matt and I don't know when we'll be back next. It'll be sometime before the draft, which takes place on June 28th. So follow us on social media. On Twitter, we're at Fireside Podcast. On Facebook, facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. You can uh, go to our website, firesidechat.ca. We'll use those methods to let you know when we're going to be back next, but assume it'll be sometime in June, unless there's breaking news before then. Yeah, and we'll be breaking down the draft um like we have to wait till the draft lottery uh to see because the flames might draft move lottery up or if whatever, we, whatever. Who our gm is there's a lot of things we have to wait for yeah and we'll break down like anybody who's roughly in the area that the flames are picking uh to look at as targets for the flames in the first round and even guys to keep an eye on for the second round and beyond and all that kind of fun stuff um frankly in the first round i'm assuming that the flames because of the fact that they they don't have an urgent need for defensemen will go forward but that's about all i can say on that for right now we'll talk about that in june so yeah. follow us and we'll let you know when we'll be back in june um if you want to sign up on firesidechat.ca for us to email you when a new episode comes out and that way you won't miss anything and as we do every year, uh, we would ask that if you could please rate us and review us wherever you listen to podcasts, it would really help. It would help to expand our reach and let more Flames fans join our community here at Fireside Chat. So whether that's uh, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to us, if you could leave us a rating and review, we'd really appreciate it. And I'm going to put in a plug again since it's my last chance to do so. Uh, if you're coming down to the Calgary Expo, which takes place uh, the weekend of the 29th, some people know it as Comic-Con, the Calgary Comic Book Expo. I will be there on the 29th at 1.15 p.m. And if you're interested in podcasting, I'll be giving a talk called the Podcast Starters Guide. It'll be on the podcast stage. I'd love to see you. I'd love to have some support from our audience. Let me know afterwards or beforehand if you see me there that you're a Fireside Chat listener. I'd love to shake your hand and I'll have some swag for Fireside Chat listeners as well. Yeah, just no pictures. Otherwise, you'll break the camera. <laughs> That's why we don't do a video podcast, right, Matt? Yep. We both have a face for radio. Exactly. All right, my friend. Well, you have a good off season, and I will talk to you in June. Yep. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.